Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you can see, a bit of stuck for a catchy title. Um, I spent ages trying to think of something really catchy and cool and nerdy, and they were just sticking everyone go, that's cool. I failed, so I kind of went for more words and brain, really, on that one. Um, so, Outpost 24, we're a Swedish vulnerability management company. Um, we build our technology in-house, so we like to break other vendors' stuff and find vulnerabilities in it, um, because that's what vulnerability guys are supposed to do. Um, we've been doing it for 12 years. I've been there for well, up to five years now, and I'm still not bored of all the traveling, um, occasionally. Um, and we do other things like pen testing, research, related work, uh, professional services. Yeah, that one, that's it. Had enough of that one. So me, um, I'm John Stock. I am a senior security consultant at Outpost 24. Um, at least that was the job title the last time I checked. And I seem to have a new one every month at the moment, which is very handy. Um, and pretty much my main occupation is an infrastructure security nerd. Um, I, you know that guy you have in the office? There's always that one guy who has a Juniper firewall at home for his internet. He has a checkpoint firewall for his DMZ with his dodgy malware running in it. He has uh, a PFSense firewall to VM off all his dodgy Windows XP that he really needs to update for next year. I'm that guy. Um, I have more infrastructure in running in my house than most people have in their company. Um, it's quite embarrassing, but I like to play. Um, I would like to say I have nothing better to do, but that would be a lie as well. Um, why am I here? This isn't some cool sort of um, existential question or anything like that, and I certainly ain't claiming I'm God. Um, I'm just like Monty Python, and I thought it was a good slide to have. Um, but why am I here? So I've sat in a lot of conferences, um, <coughs> similar to Stuart from Microsoft. I go to DEF CON and Black Hat in Las Vegas every year, um, and I have to say Microsoft put on a wicked party, and I usually get drunk on, try and drink their profits pretty much. Um, I haven't, I haven't made it yet, but they make me suffer the next morning, put it that way. Um, so why am I here? Because sometimes you sit there and you see some guy sat there or someone presents to you and you're like, why is that person doing it? Why are they telling me this? Anyone could have told me this. So uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about me. So first things first, 20 years ago, I lived for a year just above this building. So I, I studied at Plymouth University. Um, I did the Computer Systems and Networks degree, CSN for those of us who were here. Um, not candy, boo, hiss, boo, hiss, if it's still going, boo, didn't like them. Um, that was computing and informatics, they did like databases and stuff, and that's boring. Um, so I came to Plymouth University, hence the reason I got in contact with Steve in the first place. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of forgot to leave. Um, I still live in, around Plymouth, I live 11 miles that way. Um, which makes it weird, well, I live, work for a Swedish company, um, so I do a lot of travelling. But why am I here talking about vulnerability management stuff? Well, I've been doing it for a vendor for five years, and as you guys probably all know, vendors suck. Um, no one likes a vendor, no one ever thinks, yeah, I'm going to spend an hour talking to a vendor today. Really looking forward to that. Um, so before that, I spent ten years working at EDF Energy over there. So I've, I've spent time doing the, the real world stuff, not that lovely world that the vendor thinks exists. Um, so I've done real world stuff, so I started off as a sysadmin, um, working on our IS2 warp those days. That's a blast, and that's even older than XP. Um, and Windows NT and stuff like that. And I kind of went into the, no one wants to look after the firewall. I was like, hey, firewalls, sounds cool, I'll do that. And yeah, it all progressed into the fact I've now got a million of them at home. So I've done, done the real world work. I've done the vulnerability scanning in a real company. Um, I haven't just gone into the vendor, read all the gumps we have and try and send it to you that way. Um, also, um, we are talking about security earlier and the wonderful thing that I always tell people as well is that social engineering is the same as a DDoS. It's gonna work. You know, people who spend money on a DDoS testing why are you doing that? It's going to work one way or another, and if it does, people doing it aren't trying hard enough. Um, getting across the bit here, the quad upstairs, those of you who came in, there's like two quads upstairs. 
Um, one of my tasks was always to get from one side of it to my actual room without the guards and security catching me, particularly if I'd done something wrong that week. Um, usually involved getting drunk and eggs. Um, the other thing being there's some telephones just in the other quad there. Um, there was a number you could use that you could put in, put your money in, phone your mum and dad, tell them you're all okay at university, um, then put the thing up and it would give you all your money back. Um, anyone from Plymouth University, I'm sorry, I never used it, okay? But, you know, that was my first foray into poking around to say, how can we break things? How can we get things to do something that they're not supposed to do? So what I won't be doing. Um, so here you can see a really meaningless graph. Here is a meaningless graph. It doesn't mean anything. In fact, it actually doesn't. It's about shipping. Um, I'm not going to come up with a lot of graphs that don't mean anything with yeah, years of vulnerabilities and how many have been found and things like that. Because, yeah, that's for the marketing guys to throw at you and I'm not trying to sell you anything, so I'm not going to do that. So if anyone does want to see anything about bulk carriers and ships and types of ships, it's kind of interesting. Um, what I will be doing, <coughs> giving you the keys to the kingdom. You know, I can come here and I can speak to you for maybe five minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, however. I can give you ideas. I can give you things that you think, I oh, work for me, that's really good. Or things that are gonna kind of come back to you and you'll say, hey, I remember that guy who should have worn a shirt so he had something to put the microphone on. Um, I remember him telling me about this. And yeah, maybe you'll find something useful. But I'm not gonna say, go back to your organization if you do these 20 things, that's it. You'll never get hacked. Because um, then you'll probably all see me and I'd be very poor. So, vulnerability management. You've definitely all heard of it. Everybody's heard of it. I think even my mother's heard of it. Probably because I work for a company that does it. But, yeah, everybody's pretty much heard of it. But you don't do it by choice. So, you're probably all doing something in your, in your, in your organisation. You're either forced by compliance, PCI is one of the few that says you must do scanning and use an ASV and lots of finger wagging. Um, PCI is probably the only one that says you must do it like this. Um, things like socks say you should do it and you know, various other things with the Basel 2 and things. They all say you should do all these things but they don't really enforce it. Um, however, we all have auditors and I was sat just in front of an auditor earlier. Um, <coughs> You're lovely people. We all love auditors, um, especially when they're on our side and we want something. Um, however, they often make us do things we don't want to do. Um, usually it's sit next to us for half a day and have an auditor say to us, right, show me what you do with your tool X. And it's like, uh, well, I kind of look at this and I get some graphs and yeah, it's cool. And they're like, okay, how about this? Uh, so yeah, auditors kind of, not everybody's fan, but they're important and we all do love them. Um, but they can make you do things. You possibly be forced to do it by auditors. Um, you never go and think, hmm, what should I do today? I'm gonna, oh, oh I just broke my microphone. Um, I'm gonna go and do some VM, that's it. Um, I'm gonna go and find a vulnerability management tool. I'm gonna find out all my vulnerabilities and I'm going to do it yeah, never gonna do that. Um, Unfortunately, pretty much nobody has a policy that says vulnerability management, we need to do it and this is how we're going to do it and this is how it's going to run. No one's ever got that. It's, which, it would be nice, you know, coming from a background where I like to do vulnerability management, so shoot me now, I like, enjoy it. Um, <coughs> if more people had a policy, yeah, it would make life a lot easier for all the companies, less surprises. Um, and pretty much never because it looks fun because it's not unless you're a nerd like me. So, first thing I want to talk about is strategy. Um, now, as I looked through the list of when I was going to be on talking to you guys, I saw me at the bottom and I thought, if I make lots of lists of words and lots of things like that, you're all going to kind of doze off and, you know, yeah, I did very similar speech and talk thing at InfoSec this year in uh, Owls Court. And pretty much um, the first thing that uh, I noticed was I was the last person on the last day, the beer blocker. So uh, I kind of figured, lots of pictures, not a lot of words. I'm afraid, guys, I've gone for the pictures. Um, so I've said I'm a nerd. I like real-time strategy games. I'm sorry. Again, shoot me. It's, I'm sorry. Um, strategy. You know, if I get a game like this, Red Alert, Command and Conquer, any one of those, if I come in, 
build, 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 attack, die. It's what you do. Um, vulnerability management is exactly the same. You come in, tool, tool, money, money, tool, tool, money, money, ah, oh, hands. Fuck it. Um, you can't throw money at it. Oh, you can, uh, it doesn't work. Um, and you can't just go in there and say, okay, vulnerability management, yeah, we've got that, tick in the box. Brilliant, we've just spent all that money. Um, you've got to have a strategy behind it. And I don't just mean someone who's written an A4 and says, okay, we're going to put it in on this day, we're going to run our scans then, we're going to find vulnerability results, we're going to patch them on this day, and we're going to be all safe. Because it do not work like that. Um, it changes, and it pretty much changes pretty every day. So if I take our tool, um, we have anywhere between 10, 20, 30 vulnerabilities a day going into the tool. Um, Patch Tuesday, I'm so glad it's gone. Um, Patch Tuesday, it goes through the roof. You know, there's a ton of vulnerabilities come out Patch Tuesday. Um, I sit there and watch things go and I'm like, huh, well, I'm gonna scan the Windows boxes again, that'll be fun. Um, so that's not the right way to do it, by the way. It's just I work for them, I just press the button now and again. Um, you need a strategy, so why are you doing it? Don't just go in willy-nilly thinking, yeah, if someone needs to tick that box again. Why are you doing your vulnerability scanning? Why are you doing vulnerability management? So you need a strategy, some way of actually working through it properly. Um, again, it's one of those things that your strategy is based around how your business works. I can't sit here and tell you, by the way, here's your strategy. Um, I've got three inches if you print it out of paper with a perfect strategy on it. Um, your business, if you're fighting financial, um, is going to have a different strategy to your business if you're in, say, petrochemicals or something like that. But you need a, a strategy behind it or something of planning how it's going to work. Um, anybody here like to play chess? <coughs> I wasn't the only one who went to chess club at school. Um, you need the right people at the right level. So if I came out here with a chess board and said, right, we're just playing chess with all pawns today, it's going to be really naff. Um, how do you know who's won? You know, you never know. If I come out and said, oh, okay, we're going to have all kings today, it's going to be chaos. You know, nothing's going to work and you're going to win all the time. That's not fun. Um, all queens? Yeah, I shouldn't have said that one. That would be quite good. But, um, you need the right people, you need a mix of people being involved. So with vulnerability management, you run your vulnerability scans and you come back with vulnerability information. So either your systems, either internal or internet facing, that have got vulnerabilities in them. What do you do with them? Well, you want to patch them, pretty important. Um, so you have to then decide how you're going to patch them. Do you have the say so to say, this needs to be patched by this team on this day? Probably not. Yeah, I know from um, previous job, I don't even know where I worked, um, that when I found vulnerabilities that I had to get patched, going and speaking to the right people and saying, we need to patch this and this is why, I had to come up with business cases and things like that that I really couldn't be bothered to be doing. Um, they're boring paperwork, I wasn't so interested in that, I need to be breaking stuff. But I had to justify every single little change, even Windows patches, to say, there's these critical Windows patches that need to be installed, someone needs to do it. Um, if you can get someone on a higher level that can, can emanate down, this is what needs to be done. If we have vulnerabilities, they're of a critical nature, um, they need to be fixed within 30 days. <clears throat> Brilliant, put that in your strategy. So it all kind of goes back to your strategy, getting the right people involved at the right time and have, get, get a strategy on board and get everybody on board pretty much. Um, your tools should support your processes. Now, anybody here know what ITIL is? Excellent. And a lots of, yeah, you know what ITIL is. Yeah, it's NAF. Uh, well, it's not that. it's really good. But and everybody uses it and it's a standard and I like standards because if you can understand it, I can come and talk to any one of you guys and we would know ITIL, which would be one thing in common if you're not in my, <coughs> in on the nerdy things like me. Um, and you probably wouldn't want to talk but your tools need to support your process. If you put a tool in, it doesn't have to be vulnerability management, so I'm gonna go out a little bit here. Um, any tool, and you build a process around it, what happens if that company goes bust? What happens if you change tools, or you get taken over by another company, and they wanna put their tools in? And you know, your, your tool has got to support your process, 
rather than your process being built around the tools because tools are very specific. You might bring a new tool in that adds functionality or you lose functionality or the workflow is different or anything like that. Um, particularly important with vulnerability scanning simply for the simple reason that your business isn't going to die if you don't do vulnerability scanning. I'm sorry marketing people um, had to say that. Um, you know, if you don't do it, it's not the end of your business. Um, and there's a lot of things to do with what we guys in IT security do that if we didn't do it, your business wouldn't fall flat on its face. Not straight away at any rate. So, got it back again. Um, you know, after a while, you know, if you took all your firewalls out, your business would keep going for about 20 minutes, but it would keep going. Um, you know, if you take the tools out, the processes and things that keep your business going would still be there. Um, but you've got to build your tools into your process, but have them just supporting it, not have the process built around it. If you haven't guessed, I like Star Wars and Monty Python and all the things any stereotypical geek would like. Um, so, start small and grow. Now, I've been doing this for five years with the vendor, um, and it's great, I love it, but the number of times I'll go in a company and they're like, well, yeah, no, we've put it in and it's brilliant, but we don't know what to do with all the data. Okay, what have you done? Well, we had to scan 40,000 hosts and we scanned them all last week and now we've got all these vulnerabilities and it's just too much. Oh, if I had a wall here, I'd hit my head on it. Um, it's never going to work if you do that. Uh, you've got to start small and build up. You've got to have something, you know, if you look at a, a hike across Dartmoor, if someone gave you a map and said, you're going all the way across Dartmoor and, you know, you're going all the way across to, to Oakhampton. You look at that and you look on the map and you're like, whoa, that's a long way. But if someone said, oh, you have to go over to that hill there and then that hill there, and you're doing it, it's not actually that bad. All right, it is, it really is a long way. But you know, if you do it in small stages, it's not that bad. Um, and the same with VA. If you start small, you start with a core set of assets and then grow it, things are gonna get better. You just need to start with things that are important to you. If you start going out scanning 500 laptops here and 500 workstations there, um, hopefully you have a standard build of one farm or another, or more than one standard build. Usually you see two or three or four standard builds, but it's not very standard, but I'm not one to argue. Um, so hopefully all your workstations, desktops, everything like that, they all have a standard build. So why scan 500 things that are identical when you can start off with scanning one of them that will tell you pretty much what the other 499 look like. Um, it's with the same with anything. If you start with a small kind of small cross section, um, take a good look at that and a really good look. Get that fixed, double up. Get that fixed, double up. And you find that uh, those 30,000 hosts get eaten up in a couple of months. Your security posture hasn't really got worse because you've been slower because you weren't doing anything before, so you've at least knocked some off the, uh, the numbers now. Um, okay, you have to set up a tool. Vulnerability management, vulnerability scanning, you're going to have a tool. Um, and perfect timing for the time of year. Uh, I'm pretty sure the bin men will take them. If you put rubbish in, you're going to get rubbish out. If you just put random data in, piles of data, all sorts of things in, so yeah, we'll just put in this asset management data, asset database, we'll put in this pile of assets here, and yeah, we've got that, and they could be in New York, but we don't know, you're gonna get rubbish out. Um, I'm a big fan of putting good data into a tool. Um, if you have any tool, doesn't matter what it is, again, doesn't have to be the VM type of tool, any tool, when you're putting data into it, um, if you put good, meaningless, good meaningful data in, uh, you segregate your data <coughs> out, so whether it's by location or by building or anything like that, um, if you segregate it out, then when someone comes up to you and says, yeah, run me a report, so what, to what Plymouth office is looking like, and I want to know all the Windows workstations that are in Plymouth and haven't been scanned for three months. Yep, here's a list of all of them. Okay, run a scan on them tonight. Uh, if you don't kind of segregate your data, yeah, you're going to have a lot, well, don't, people don't pay overtime anymore, so uh, you're going to have a lot of late night working trying to find, find that information out and uh, get the right info in there. Asset management. Who here does asset management? It's boring, isn't it? And, and nods as well, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, asset management isn't exciting. 
Um, I grabbed this one, so yeah, I grabbed this, did a quick search for asset management on Google and tried to find the most complicated diagram I could find. This wasn't it, but it had the prettiest colours. Um, so I decided it was a, a kind of a good one to use, but everybody thinks asset management is a case of, yeah, 15 workstations in that building. It, it's not. So with not just, again, a VM solution, but pretty much anything where you're putting asset data in there, Try data overload. Give your assets some significance. I'm afraid there's text, not a picture for this one because I couldn't really explain this in a, it's quite a specific picture. Um, but give your assets some significance. So put in a project name. If, they, if they're part of a project, put in the project name. Um, if they have a data owner, which pretty much everything has a data owner, right? Yes? Uh, didn't think so. Um, you should have a data owner for your data. Um, put it in for that asset. Um, is it critical? Not critical? Test box? Is it the box that people use to book time at the gym so they can use the company gym which has two exercise bikes and nothing else and a few smelly towels in the corner that people have forgotten because um, it happens everywhere where there's a gym. Uh, yeah, are they critical or not? You need to know that. Um, and are they physical or virtual? Believe it or not, these days that's really important. Um, you've got a virtual box, you want to not sure what's going to happen when you patch it, Oh, that's a bummer, snapshot it, great. You've got a physical box, not going to know what's going to happen when you patch it. Uh, clone it, it's not really that good an idea. Um, but yeah, it's going to take time, pretty much the same time as it would take to forensically analyze the damn thing. So, yeah, having information about your assets is important. Again, going back to the side I was on just now with your, the, asset, the asset management side of thing. If you have the project name in there, Project X, um, and it's a critical server and someone says, I want to see, you know, we're being audited and there's, see, auditors love you. Um, we're being audited and, you know, financial people are coming, auditors are coming in and they want to know what our vulnerability status is on our critical boxes in this project. I need that information in one hour. Okay. Tick, 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 bang. There's your report. Okay, it doesn't matter, doesn't mean they're particularly well scanned or particularly well patched, but you've got the report, you've got the information there about your assets. Okay, back to our teams. Um, people treat vulnerability management like a tax return. Um, no one likes doing their tax return. Everybody does their tax return in January. Um, everybody, that's me. Um, yeah, you've had a whole year to do it, so you wait until the last minute, the last minute to do it, and yeah. It kind of, you can't find those receipts, you can't find the reason that you did this, or where's that receipt from Apple because I've just bought a new laptop and it's a business asset and I really want that VAT back or something like that. Um, you always leave it to the last minute. People do that with vulnerability management all the time. Um, PCI, I mentioned it earlier. ASV scanning, so you get the accredited scanning vendors for PCI. You have to do vulnerability scans every quarter and after every major change, which is the bit that people miss out. So at least every quarter. Um, so you've got three months to prepare. I had to do the maths on that one. I couldn't work out. I remember, it's three or four months. Um, you've got three. It's a bad day today. Three months to prepare for your vulnerability scan. You should find out what assets are in there, what state they're in, run some <coughs> preliminary scans, find out what needs fixing, fix them, pass it. Does it happen? Never. Um, yeah, number of times I get. Phone calls, John, help us, we need to get this server reconfigured. It's a web server, we can't work out how to fix this, and our ASV attestation day has to be submitted tomorrow. Brilliant, guys, you know, I, I'm in India, I'm just not, oh, all right, go on then. Um, it does happen, it happens a lot. Um, it's something that, I don't know why, people just like to go and wait and wait and wait, oh, I'll press the button now. It doesn't necessarily kill everything, so you can run it beforehand. Um, planning is essential. You know, don't just run a random scan now and again. Again, you get tons of information out, tons of vulnerability information that you just like, what to do? Um, if you run regular scans, you can do things like deltas, look at what's new, what's old, what's been sitting around for six months, that's high risk vulnerability that no one's, no one's actually done anything about, which I don't know why that happens, um, but I'll get to that one. Basically, keep on top of scanning. You know, it's not a difficult thing to do these days. Any tool, ours included, you know, just mention that. Um, any tool 
you can schedule things to run. You don't even have to kind of sit there and press a button at three o'clock in the morning. Um, you can schedule an infinite amount of scans to run with the policies you want, with the reports being emailed to you, so they're in your inbox, so that every month or however often you've got the reports, and you can sit there and go, eh, boring. And honestly, no, people really do work, react to them. Um, right information, right place. This is a really bad Photoshop, by the way, of a swing going into a car. I was, just, I was getting desperate, but it's, it's, it's the worst Photoshop I've ever seen. Uh, apart from those ones you see every now and again where people have tried to put muscles on them and then posted <laughs> them to Facebook and they're kind of swirly. It's terrible. Um, but you need to have the right information in the right place. So you want to see what you need to see. Uh, see what you want to see. Um, You've got a UI, you know, pretty much every tool that you have has a user interface these days. Um, you want the right information in that UI. You don't want all these bits of info that you don't care about. If you're the kind of person like me who crunches numbers with IP, you know, IPs are my favorite thing. Um, if I have a list of IPs, I can pretty much, if I've been working for them for a while, say, okay, I know that's the web server, the mail server, VPN, don't care about that. Um, Host names, yeah, that's there. they're for people who can't remember IP addresses. So, yeah, I don't want to see that the host names in my tool. Lots of other information, you know, when it was last scanned, that sort of thing, I don't care. I want to be able to get rid of that and just have the information I want to see in my UI. Um, and I want it to be obvious at first glance. So, I came across a tool, oh man, it must have been about four or five years ago. I was trawling InfoSec um, at Earl's Court. Um, without my vendor badge on, so I always register twice, once as a vendor um, and once as a company that I've made up where I'm the executive technical director. One, it makes me feel important and um, two, you can't get any freebies if you have vendor on the, uh, on the badge. So I want a few freebies, um, usually stress balls and things to throw at people. Um, and I was going around and you know, it's, it's nice to kind of look at the nerdy tools and things and see what people are bringing out. And there was a company that did secure email. Um, who are here today, so if, yeah, just so you know you're safe. Uh, there's a company there that did secure email, and I was, you know, I asked for a quick demo, look through, just five minutes. Um, they use red as good. Why do you use red as good? Red is bad. Every time you cut yourself, you bleed, it's red, it's bad. Um, you go through a red traffic light, it's bad. Everything, everywhere, no. They decided that, yeah, but it makes it unique. I don't want unique, I want obvious. Um, yeah, I didn't see them there last year. I think that says a lot. Um, so yeah, if you've got something where you're using something that's just completely random, like red is good, um, it's not obvious what you mean. So you need to have something where, you know, what you, the data you see when you look at it, that's good, that's not so good. Now, the problem is when you get to the third one, because Red is bad, amber is medium, but you know if it's a low risk, green isn't where you go there. Green could, green is good, it's still not good. So yeah, we went for blue because we couldn't really think of another colour to use there. So yeah, if anyone comes up with a good way of what's a low risk, and then we need a standard colour for that. Um, set up templates, filter data. It's it seems obvious. But a lot of times you'll go into a tool and you'll do repetitive tasks. You're like, okay, I want to, as I mentioned earlier, get all the information out. There's a high risk for these vulnerabilities that have been sat there for more than six months. No one's accepted that risk. No one's fixed it. It's still there. Every month I go in and I create that report and it gets pretty annoying. So you need some way where you can set up templates and filters and things to say, okay, filter out this information, save it as a template, run my report based on that template. If your tools don't give you templates, go up to your vendor and give them a good kick in the backside. Um, you know, vendors should be able to supply you with that as a standard. Um, for vulnerability information, it's more important than anything else, simply because the sheer volume of data you have. Um, and try and make it simple. You know, I know a lot of us in here are probably, well, no, not a lot of us, some of us. Um, and nerds, yeah, I don't like things that look simple because other people can do it and I like to feel I'm special and if it's complicated, only I can do it. Um, but you need to try and keep that something simple. So with the VM tool, um, you want to be able to say, okay, these are the, these are the vulnerabilities I've got and there's, I don't know, 
you're running PHP. PHP is always a good example. I don't like to pick on Microsoft all the time, so I'm going to pick on PHP today. Um, so you've got a, a website that runs PHP, and you've got an application that runs on top of it. Um, the chances are, if you upgrade PHP, you're going to break that application, because PHP and backward compatibility seem to be sat in a different train or something, because they never really spoke to each other. There's pretty much no backward compatibility on PHP so, uh, at certain, certain points in their development life cycle, um, without knocking it too much. So if you have an application written for a certain volume, if you upgrade it and follow the instructions to upgrade, bang, no application. Um, so really, you don't want to know that there's these 300 vulnerabilities in PHP. You want to know that PHP is out of date and, yeah, okay, can't do anything about that. Um, and what to do with it, I'll get to in a second. Um, oh yeah, Star Wars again, oh, I'm sorry. Um, right information, right people. So, okay, I mentioned just now, I'm a nerd. Okay, I, I, I play on this one because when I was at school, uh, I used to go to chess club and computer club. I can tell you that the, the, um, the computer engineer or the, the guy who taught computing at my secondary school, which was over in Essex, so no, one, I, no one's gonna find out, because um, there's not the internet where they talk about these things. Um, so I, I was at school and we had an RM Nimbus network. Yeah, everybody had RM Nimbus in those days. And we could enable and disable applications and I wanted an application that I wasn't allowed to have, and it was to make the turtle move on the floor. We all remember that one. Um, so I sat behind our, the guy who teaches computer in school, and I can tell you now his password was Brampton. It's, I don't know why I can still remember that, like 30, no, 25, a long, over a long time. Um, but it was a kind of thing where I was like, okay, now I can get a little bit more info out. Um, I can get access to things I shouldn't do. Um, right information, yeah, wrong person, don't want me having that. Um, but with the right information for the right people, the nerdy ones among us, we like to see, okay, this is the vulnerability. Is there an exploit available for it? Hell yeah, excellent. Let's exploit, how it comes, or yeah, whatever we want, exploit DB, core. Um, I have to be vendor agnostic on these things because the other, other exploitation frameworks may be available. Um, so, yeah, you've got these exploitation frameworks, make things nice and easy. I want to know if there's an exploit available. Um, my manager doesn't give a monkeys. All he wants to know is what boxes he needs are out of date, what ones he needs to get patched, and who's going to shout at him if they're not done. His manager just wants to see some pretty pictures. Let's be honest. Um, be precise. Now, I'm sorry, I was just looking at the time. Um, I was trying to work out if it was a two or a three. I definitely got smudge on my glasses there. Um, yeah, anybody actually read this book? Yeah, it's not always right. I, I think I got, uh, yeah, February was about as far I would have got into that, and I gave up and read some Terry Pratchett instead. Um, be precise. Don't give someone who needs to fix something a long report that's that thick and half a rainforest, and you put it on their desk, turn around, they throw it back at you, hits you on the back of the head, knocks you out, really hurts, um, apparently. So try and be precise in what you're giving people. If they need to patch Windows, tell them they need to patch Windows. If their version of software is insecure, tell them it's insecure, they need to update. If they need to make a configuration change, tell them what the configuration change. Don't try and uh, yeah, keep yourself a little kingdom and uh, try and be as random as possible. Um, right, this is where I was going with earlier. Be willing to accept risk. Rock. Um, now, the, uh, I was trying to work out when I first saw this one if this was just a perspective photo, but apparently no, that actually exists. You can't fix everything. This version of PHP I was talking to you about earlier, about three minutes ago, um, you're running that version of PHP, you need it for your application, uh, you need to accept that risk because if you update it, you're going to break the application and the application could be more important than your security patching. Um, it does happen, believe it or not. So, you have to be willing to occasionally just look at something and go, okay, there's a risk, I need to accept it, um, and move on. Because if there's 200 <coughs> vulnerabilities associated with that version of PHP, you have them appear every single month, all you're going to see is 200 PHP vulnerabilities. There could be three or four really important things in there that you're missing. Um, 
But yeah, you're, you're not seeing the wood for the trees. That's the phrase I was looking for. So yeah, if you're willing to accept a risk, you can filter out what risks you've accepted and then see all the important stuff. Um, I've kind of picked on managers a lot and I'm sorry if any of you are high level managers who get this kind of report, but this is what explains to you what your problem is. So I'm afraid, uh, I'm, I'm going to, sorry, uh, I'll try not to blind anyone by accidentally pressing the button in the wrong direction. So here I have four Windows boxes that I'm scanning. So they're all Windows servers. Um, and I've been running some vulnerability scanning for them over a year. Um, Patch Tuesday, patch, patch Tuesday, patch, patch Tuesday, patch. And then I kind of thought, oh, InfoSec's coming up, I need some demo data. And as you can see, it kind of went up and settled a little bit and went up. I needed to use Java for something, so I actually upgraded Java there. Um, and it wouldn't let me, as so thankfully, the application I needed for said, your Java's out of date, I won't run until you update. And I was, nearly fell off my chair. Um, so, yeah, this is the kind of thing you need to give a manager. Not because he's stupid, because he's a manager, he's clever, he got there somehow. I think I got out of that one, right? Um, but you can see, up until here, there are vulnerabilities patch, vulnerabilities patch, vulnerabilities patch, no one patching. So somewhere around here, your process has gone completely haywire, and someone's forgotten the patch, or the person who did the patching has quit and left and got fed up because, you know, Running Microsoft patches every month isn't exactly the most enthralling thing in the world. Um, I'm kind of pretty important, divide and conquer. <coughs> now, believe it or not, DEF CON last year, this was my lunch on the first day. So, they have a burger, bar, burger place in California, Las Vegas, called In N Out Burger. Best burgers you will ever, ever eat. So, you can do the double double, which is, was that, that? No, that was a four by four. So four burgers, four slices of cheese, and uh, a bit of sauce. Four by four, animal style, which is basically this sauce in it. Fries and animal style, fantastic. But, you know, I'm sat there, just got off a long flight to Vegas. This is sat in front of me, and I'm like, where do I start? If you hadn't guessed this, I like my food, okay? It's, you can see that. Um, Kind of, okay, what's the most important thing there? Well, they're the least important, they're the fries. You know, anyone can make fries, I don't care. Um, they're kind of important, this bit here, most important of all. So, pretty much the idea is, start with what's most important, what's the bit that you paid the most for, or what's the most critical, um, and then move up from there, working way around, small chance getting it done eventually. Um, and I did finish it, and a shake, and I'm pretty sure I had burritos for dinner as well. It was a long flight, I was hungry. Um, and finally, um, know your environment. Uh, the number of people I speak to when I go in and I'm, I'm speaking to them about their environment, they're like, well, yeah, we think we've got some important service here, we know we've got some virtualization stuff here, we know we've got there, they don't really know. Um, know your environment based on its risk and its criticality. Is it internet facing? No. Uh, it's probably slightly less at risk than something that is. Um, is it critical? Well, yeah. Booking the gym, same sort of thing. And treat vulnerabilities in your critical environment as an incident. Every single vulnerability, if it's in a critical environment, should be treated as a separate incident. Um, pretty much if you leave your front door unlocked. Um, I don't do that, but you know, living 11 miles down the road in the wonders of the southwest, it's uh, not quite like London. I often leave my car unlocked on my drive. And I'm not telling you all where I live because I won't have a car tomorrow morning. Um, I'm sure you're all very trustworthy. Uh, but if I lived in the centre of London, if I left my car unlocked, I either wouldn't have a car or I'd have a shell with nothing in it. Someone would take the seats. Oh, I'm sure London's lovely. But sure, someone would take the seats, the stereo would be gone, the sat nav would be ripped out, and pretty much the whole thing would be decimated. Um, it's knowing about your risk and where, what environment you're in. If you're in a critical environment, London's a pretty critical environment, um, yeah, your risks are going to be higher. So you've got a lot of Wild West. Um, that's another analogy for the internet, the Wild West. Um, dirty, nasty, naked, filthy internet. Uh, there's lots of names for it. But yeah, just treat it as if everything you do is going to be pretty much destroyed. So back to my food analogy. Takeaways. Have a strategy, support your processes, start small and grow, have good data. 
have the right data, get involved the right people, be precise and divide and conquer. <laughs> and because I'm with the cool kids, hashtag thank you, hashtag <laughs> questions. Okay, um, thanks for that.